Greetings, Montana, and hello, world. It's Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council. Welcome to another session of our International Careers Week. Every day this week, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 2 o'clock, we're going to be talking to an extraordinary array of international experts who are going to be bringing to you their careers, their thoughts, their ideas and perspectives on how they got the job that they are doing or that they have done. That's the most common question we hear from students around Montana when we go into classrooms, when we have virtual programs, and we engage with expert speakers from around the world. Students always want to know, how did you end up an ambassador? How do you end up a UN official? And so we hope to answer some of those questions, pique some of that curiosity throughout this week as we talk to a, a, a huge range of, of people. Some of those people are here in Montana. Some are around the United States. Others are around the world because we're learning you don't need to be out in the world to engage in an international career. Let me begin by thanking our very generous sponsors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation. They help us bring this program and many other programs to you um, over and over. So sincere thanks to them. Now to introduce our very, uh, you know, a, a very extraordinary guest who has actually joined us here in Montana in person and is here virtually today. Ambassador Lisa Kubisky is a retired but active U.S. diplomat who enjoyed a career in Latin America, China, and Washington, D.C. Starting from coordinating U.S. search teams following a major earthquake in Mexico in 1985, and researching Mexican migration to the United States. Through assignments focused on democracy, prosperity, and security, she rose through the ranks to become U.S. Ambassador to Honduras and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Finance and Development. Ambassador Kubisky earned state's highest award for her earthquake relief work. Since retirement, Lisa has been a guest lecturer at universities, think tanks, non-governmental organizations, including here at the Montana World Affairs Council. Ambassador Kubisky, great to see you again. Welcome to the program. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and I love talking to the Montana students. <laughs> well, we're, we're so happy you could come again because, as I said, you visited us here a couple of years ago, and, and we've, had, we've been very fortunate to have a number of... Um, ambassadors and high-ranking diplomats who have joined us here in Montana. We go out to these classrooms and it's fascinating for students to hear about the life of a diplomat and that question over and over to you while you were here and your colleagues. Ambassador, how do you become an ambassador? So we're looking forward to your perspectives on your career and the career of a diplomat. Over to you. Okay. Well, first, um, let me entice you by telling you that in my very first tour, I coordinated search teams in Mexico after Mexico had one of its biggest earthquakes. And um, that's sort of an example of this serendipity that can happen when you're a Foreign Service officer. So it's fun, it's adventuresome, um, and uh, I hope you'll all consider it. But now that I've said that, I'll come back to the pros and cons later. But yes, I was a career foreign service officer, uh, which means a U.S. diplomat. Um, it's a there there. Uh, permit. Let me click on this one more time. Uh, a permanent part of the U.S. diplomatic corps. I rose through the ranks of the career to become U.S. ambassador to Honduras, and I did many many things on the way. There, you might be a little confused. There are two types of um, ambassadors, uh, politically appoint, well, political ones and career ones. Political ones tend to be the friends of the president or the friends of his or her um, political party or campaign, or sometimes they have some particular expertise, um, environmental advocacy, for example. Um, they usually um, contribute a lot of money. That's not me, I'm a career one, came in 
through an exam process. Exam is free to everybody who is uh, 20 to 59. Um, and, and, but either way, whether you're political or career, you um, work for elected leaders. You, um, you subsume your own political views in your public persona and you um, represent our elected government, particularly our elected president and his cabinet. Okay, so um, how did I get involved? I was lucky enough uh, to have plenty of exposure to, the, to US and world affairs, uh, starting from when I was very young. And I was always really interested in that. But to give you an idea, um, when I was in elementary school, which is a very long time ago now, um, we, my teachers used to wheel in a TV into the classroom and there was a closed circuit program on news of the week. And it was domestic news, it was foreign news. And, um, and then I had these teachers who were telling me and everybody, you can be anything you want. You could even be president of the US. Of course, not everybody can be president of the US, but that's okay. The um, So I had a lot of exposure to learning about the United States and what was going on politically, economically, socially, and also about the world. When I started, uh, you know, it, World War II was in people's vivid memories and the aftermath of it, what is US place in the world was in everybody's mind. That isn't to say that I knew I wanted to be a diplomat. I absolutely did not. In college, I had different majors, uh, but I did have a lot of international exposure. My, I had a mother who loved, loved to travel and I got to see a lot of cultures that way. When I was in college, I did a year abroad program in Peru. And um, later on, I got a master's in international affairs. Having, so that's how my interest developed. But having said that, the State Department doesn't care whether you have a master's degree or even a college degree. They care that you pass this free exam that's offered about three times a year. So keep that in mind. Uh, you do have to be curious and learn about the world and so on. So then how did I move up? Um, you are assigned uh, someplace to go. Typically it's overseas in your first tour, your first assignment for a couple of years. After that, you start to bid on assignments and bid means you provide a list of where you would be willing to go. Although you've already signed up for worldwide availability in case the State Department definitely wants to send you someplace, that doesn't actually happen very often, but uh, it could. Um, and then you work your way through the career, uh, keeping in mind what is US foreign policy what are the interests of Washington leaders? What, what am I hearing about from the US, from citizens? Um, you make it fit into what you do fits into that foreign policy framework so that you are always trying to contribute to what everybody else around you wants. And then you uh, try to be creative with it. You try to be responsive with it and you hopefully um, find a mentor. Uh, you become known through your work and through your connection. Okay, uh, let me talk about why this is important. It's pretty simple. Um, somebody found a quote, quote from former President Truman, the president at the very end of World War II. He said um, that, um, this is about US national interest. So what's US national interest? It's survival, which you could call security, and it's prosperity. Keep it, that's it. Survival and prosperity. And, and you could add representing our values overseas. So diplomats try to avoid a war um, or they help inform Washington about what's going on to prepare for a war if that were God forbid the case, or they sometimes help end a war through negotiations. You know, can we negotiate a truce? Can we negotiate a ceasefire? What would be the conditions to move on to something more permanent? So they work uh, as a component part of our tool, our national toolkit. You can think of the military as part of our, our toolkit, 
but diplomacy is also part of our toolkit. What U.S. interests are for security and prosperity, we cannot achieve all by ourselves. Um, if you think of drug trafficking, drugs coming in from other countries uh, into the U.S., or you think of poverty, you have people migrating to the U.S. because their governments uh, did not, and their con their uh, private sector did not provide sufficiently for security and prosperity in their own countries. You can think of the Central Americans or the Venezuelans most recently. Um, these are examples uh, of um, where the U.S. can't achieve these things all by, by yourself. So what do diplomats do? Um, they build and then maintain relationships. You may have heard some of our leaders, including President Biden, talking about the need to um, have allies and partners in the world. You can think of Russia invading Ukraine and the U.S. thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be a threat to U.S. democracy because the uh, Russians may not stop with just Ukraine. They may keep going into other countries and eventually the support for democracy is weaker. Um, so we might want to have sanctions. What kind of sanctions? Who's going to support us when we have these sanctions? Or if you think of China, uh, you think of what, how China treats U.S. businesses or any foreign business. Um, is it fair? Is it unfair? Are there things the U.S. can do to negotiate uh, better conditions for our, our folks? Um, consular work. We have Americans who get into trouble overseas. There's one pretty vivid example of an American who married a, a foreigner and the foreigner turned out to be abusive and stole the American's passport and the U.S. Embassy stepped in to uh, try to um, get, well, issue a new passport and help the American get out of the country. So those are all examples. What do we do in a typical day? Almost every, anything, everything. If you're the ambassador, you're at the top of a pyramid, you have a big staff underneath you. It's State Department people, but it's anybody under who works for the US government, except for the soldiers that are in theater commands. Um, and so uh, you might start a day meeting with your, they call it country team leaders, the supervisors in each of the different offices. You might meet with a senior political leader or a, a citizens group or a business group or individuals. You might um, go to visit a, a project that the U.S. is paying for or helping to support in some way. You might meet with other diplomats to develop a coordinated position. You uh, will always be informing Washington what's going on. You might give a public interview. You uh, might give out awards to your staff who are doing great work. And if you are lucky enough to have a congressional delegation or even the US president come to town, you're helping to organize that, um, that schedule. What are the, uh, the highlights? You get to see the world, that's wonderful, it's fun. You get all these new experiences that you might not have in the US um, or uh, that you never expected to have. I mentioned the earthquake relief at the beginning of this, this segment. Um, you're you are representing the United States in everything you do to the uh, people it, of the country you're in and to others for that matter. And um, that gives a lot of satisfaction. Public service is an important uh, positive. Um, the impact of, or the feeling of doing something meaningful in, in you know, something bigger than yourself. And you, um, and maybe the last thing I'll mention is you get a lot of skills that are um, applicable later, er, everything you can imagine. The downsides, um, moving every couple of years can be hard on families. Um, sometimes your spouses have a hard time figuring out employment opportunities. Um, you have to get up to speed in a new country very quickly. People joke that in six months, you're the expert. <laughs> um, they, um, and some of the places you'll be assigned are actually dangerous, particularly 
maybe if you're an ambassador, you're always, you know, you're always a target, but um, it could be anybody. So finally, last two things, characteristics of a U.S. diplomat. Uh, they like adventure. They like public service. They want an impactful career. They're curious about the world around them. They're they can keep calm in times of stress. There's, a lot, there's lots of stress in the world and they can think quickly on their feet. They're also high energy. They work well with teams and they communicate effectively. And if you wanna become uh, a diplomat, what can you do? Um, you can do almost anything, but you wanna make sure you're, lear you're thinking about how does the US work, the political system, the economic system, the cultural trends that are going on. Um, and you also want to pay attention to um, what's going on in the world, key issues in the world. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have and uh, hopefully encouraging you to think about this career. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We have a number of participants. I'm just going to remind everybody, please chat your questions into me. I'll curate them and ask the Ambassador. And not surprisingly, Ambassador, we have our friends from Bozeman High School who are quick off the mark with a lot of questions. I am now referring to the following as the Bozeman High School speed round of questions because there are so many. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and ask you to respond in relatively short order so we can get through them. Let's start with the first one. What is your favorite part of being an ambassador? I think it was um, being able to represent the United States in a way that I hope the US would be represented and, um, and being able to make a small contribution. What exactly did you do to coordinate relief efforts in Mexico? Oh, we had uh, three different kinds of search teams. Um, the dog handlers, you know, a, a person and their dog looking for um, the scent of people buried in the rubble. And then two teams from uh, that were mining related. Uh, one with seismic sounding equipment. You could ask questions if they could hear the questions they could not be answered. And, um, and then one that had a camera, which would show you how to dig to the people. We saved people. Um, we publicized what we did, um, and uh, we ran kind of a dispatch operation between the three groups, and then also groups coming in from other countries. Ambassador, you touched on this next one, but maybe um, a little more. Um, is the job of an ambassador dangerous? It can be dangerous. Um, it depends uh, where you are or what issues you're handling. In Honduras, for example, um, one of the big problems Honduras faced that affected us was uh, uh, drugs uh, coming up from South America into the U.S. via Honduras. Um, so we helped the Honduras in a number of ways to try to um, take down the cartels that were in Honduras and cut off the financing that they received. Um, that made me a target. It made my successor a target. So that's an example. Uh, countries that where terrorism is a big deal, uh, that if the if some of the people want to blame the U.S. for that, the, those are places that can be dangerous. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Foreign Service exam? Is it difficult? How do you prepare for it? Well, the the simplest thing is if you go to careers.state.gov, you can read um, a lot about it. And there's a link from, in once you get there, there's a link to the foreign service exam. You can take a practice exam. Um, I guess it's difficult because a lot of people take the exam, but not that many people pass it. Um, but it's a sort of uh, basic, uh, do you know what kind of struct, what government, kind of government, um, is the United States or is Germany or some other country? Um, do you know um, how to read a, a bar graph that you would see in a newspaper that's talking about economic conditions? Do you understand what inflation is? Um, then a lot of common sense stuff. If you were ordering toilets for the embassy um, and you wanted to um, 
figure out the best supplier. How would you do that? You know, and consular work, how just judgment questions about taking care of American citizens or um, some public affairs. Would you show the movie West Side Story in, to an audience in your foreign country? What book would you recommend? Who would you bring in as a speaker? That kind of thing. That's great advice on the um, website. I'd encourage all of the students who are watching and also taking part in our program, Academic World Quest, to take the Foreign Service exam. It's available online. I've done it before in the past. It's really enjoyable, actually, and you get insight into you know, what kinds of fields and what kinds of skills uh, is the U.S. State Department looking for. Um, Ambassador, um, how long does it take to rise through the ranks to become an ambassador? <laughs> well, first off, not everybody becomes an ambassador. Um, you know, I, I don't know, in the military system, you, uh, you can think people who become, in, say, in the Army become generals or in the Navy become admirals. Um, the, uh, it, it it's the same in the uh, Foreign Service. There's a senior Foreign Service um, where most of the ambassadors and deputy chiefs of mission, that means vice ambassadors, where they are uh, located. But um, the, I guess the basic career is about 20 years or so to up to that point. Then you make a choice do you want to compete to be in this senior foreign service as opposed to the regular foreign service? And if you choose to compete, um, a lot of people are called out at that point, but the people who make it you know, go on for a number of years more. Ambassador, we had somebody on yesterday talking about the foreign service. There was a lot of questions about whether knowing a second or third language was requisite or important. And not many of us know about the language school and the training afforded by the State Department. Could you talk a little bit about language skills? Um, first of all, they are not required to enter the foreign service. They are required to get tenure in the Foreign Service, which typically happens after two tours, let's say four years, something like four years or five years. Um, and then if you wanna be in the senior Foreign Service, they require a second foreign language at a certain level of proficiency. So, uh, but the State Department will train you in, the, in languages at whatever language is spoken in the country you're going to. And um, their language school is top notch because they, it, it's very, it's totally based on your absolutely having to use the language. And so they, um, it, it, that I guess enough said. So it's, you could think of it as another benefit of the foreign service that you, that you come in and they'll pay, they'll send you to, you know, their school for, um, depends six months or a year or even two years. I studied Mandarin for two years, for example, with them. If you speak, um, you pass the exam, but then um, if you do have a foreign, a, a certain foreign languages um, that can be beneficial later on in, in getting the assignments that, that you might want. And speaking of benefits, Ambassador, the question, nuts and bolts here is, does an ambassador get paid well? Um, well, if you live in the Washington or New York or Boston or San Francisco area, you wouldn't think it is paid super well. If you live in Montana, you might think it's paid very well. Um, the, I think the top... Uh, the most an ambassador can get is something around I don't I don't remember the exact number, but maybe one hundred eighty three thousand. Uh, but if you th compare that to what CEOs of top uh, businesses uh, earn, it that's nothing. Um, but it you know it it's it gives you a middle class life in the U.S. in, in the East Coast of the U.S. and in the West Coast of the U.S. Um, it's okay. What they do do is when you're overseas, they're giving you housing. 
and um, they're uh, giving you a contribution toward your health insurance. So you have that in addition. And um, they'll pay for um, private international school for your kids. And so that those are all big benefits that, you know, boost it. You, but on the other hand, you have some additional expenses, like you mostly travel home at your own expense. Ambassador, when you look back at high school and university and postgraduate, um, could you tell us if there were any particular courses or themes or topics that really encouraged you to think about the world and an international career? Well, I I came in with, you know, I, I had a lot from my family in elementary school of that was uh, exposure to international things. But international doesn't necessarily mean government. It could mean uh, working for a company. It could mean working for a nonprofit. It could mean being an academic, uh, you know, a, a professor somewhere. So, and I did, really didn't know uh, which of those things I wanted to do. Um, my major as an undergraduate, I had two. One was anthropology and psychology. Anthropology, almost by definition, is international. Psychology is, you know, internal to your mind. Um, they fit together very nicely, and I've always thought that that was the single best preparation I ever had academically. But I did go get an international affairs degree, which is uh, politics or government uh, and economics mostly, um, and that was very helpful too. And that was in graduate school. That's really interesting because we're hearing over and over um, from the experts that we're talking with this week about the importance of a diversity, again, of background and particularly academic background at the undergraduate level. Um, it's not necessary to have an undergraduate international relations degree to enjoy an international career. Um, you know, again, uh, these employers, the State Department, the UN and others are looking for a diversity of skills, abilities and talents. So one shouldn't feel like you must study a particular thing if you want to um, work these jobs, although there are some that are obviously helpful. Um, uh, last one from Bozeman here is, uh, of course, we hear about uh, stressful, uh, difficult, intense situations around the world and the U.S. ambassador in these places that is at the forefront of American foreign policy. Can you talk about a time when you've been in a tense situation in another country? I think uh, a lot of the security work that I did in Honduras uh, uh, fits that, that bill because uh, there were actually threats uh, on, on my life. Um, and because we actually were having some success. So um, uh, that, it, that was stressful all the time. There's also kind of low grade stress from if, if you're the boss, you're depending on everybody to do their job well. And if they don't do their job well, you get blamed. And um, we had a, a case um, where that was quite controversial, even in the the newspapers, in, 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 even in the New York Times, where uh, we had a training program, a pilot training program uh, with uh, Honduras on how to interdict um, uh, planes carrying drugs to prevent them from uh, moving those drugs further into the United States. And in the course of that, um, unfortunately, some civilians uh, died. And in that case, um, they, it, it was painful because the civilians died. Um, it was part of the reason was they had never had an, uh, counter drug enforcement in that part of the country. But part of the problem was that um, some of the people um, who were uh, carrying it out from a different agency were um, not following my instructions. And so of course I got blamed for that. It led to a huge investigation by two agencies, by the Justice Department, the State Department, um, and, um, and where uh, it took a long time to get through that. And, um, but in the end, I was exonerated. I got great reviews 
I wasn't blamed for it, but it took a long time to work through that. That was very stressful. Thanks for that, Ambassador. I'd like to wrap up with a question of my own, just to ask, uh, uh, you, you've mentioned it, and I'd like to hear a little bit more from your perspective. Uh, again, it's interesting when I hear the same thing from many of our guests, and you mentioned it specifically, the idea or the quality of being adventurous and being curious. Uh, what does that mean to you? And can you share a little bit with the students, you know, how one might cultivate that in order to support an international career? <laughs> um, well, adventure, adventuresome is probably a, just a personality trait. Um, you know, if you're bored staying at home all the time and you just want to see something else, you know, that kind of thing. Um, curious, you can cultivate it by um, reading up or watching movies or talking to people about anything that catches your attention. Um, in a professional setting, you have to do it. You have to be current on what's going on around you. And so you're talking to people all the time. It takes a lot of energy, but talking to people can give you energy as well. Um, I, there's one more point I wanted to make, which is um, in this career, you you, I spent about half of my career in Washington and half of my career overseas. Some people are overseas a little bit more, some people a little bit less, but it is this mixture because you're always working uh, with Washington, meaning with uh, our government officials and with companies and so on. And um, you're, you're always informing them and being informed by them. So it's an interplay all the time. Well, that's a great place to wrap up, Ambassador, because that is also another point that many people have made, um, that while we talk about international careers, and sometimes it can be very clinical and policy and rules and doing this and doing that, at the base of so much of this work is the human interaction, the human connections. It's mm -hmm. what drives the work, and it's what often brings people into the work, the interest in interacting with others. So, Thank you for that. And thank you so much for bringing your views and perspectives. Um, we talked about your life culminating as an ambassador, but it was great to hear also about the U.S. State Department and the Foreign Service. Of course, not everybody becomes an ambassador, but there are a lot of opportunities out there for people who are interested in the world international careers and representing the United States. So much appreciated uh, on that, Ambassador. Let me just quickly, before I uh, before I wrap up, I'd like to thank our very generous sponsors once again at the Dennis uh, and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation. Now, uh, we've just spoken with Ambassador Kubiski coming up today. Uh, in fact, at 1130, we speak with Amy Friedman, who is a longtime international educator. There is an extraordinary opportunity for people to go out into the world to teach English and other subjects in schools all around the world. So you won't want to miss that. That's followed after lunch by three colleagues from the World Wildlife Fund, and that's going to wrap it up for today. So Ambassador Kubiski, once again, from all of us here at the Montana World Affairs Council and across Montana, we thank you and look forward to your next visit. Okay, thank you so much. Take care, have fun. Thank you, and bye-bye.